Welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite, featuring the sharpest minds in marketing, inspirational case histories, and weekly insights you can apply to your business. Find out why top CMOs rank this podcast among their favorites. Now, here's your host, Chief Marketing Renegade, Drew Neiser. Last year, a listener of Renegade Thinkers Unite mentioned that she loved the show, but wished I had more women CMOs on it. Not even realizing this bias, I, I went back and counted. I realized it was 60, 40 male, female. So I set a goal for 2019 that this year, that not just what it would be 50-50 balance, but that I would also interview the top women in technology. On the very top of that list is Ann Lunas, Executive Vice President and CMO of Adobe, who this year was inducted into the AMA's Marketing Hall of Fame among many accolades. So guess what? Anne is with us today for what I know will be a very special ap- episode. So Anne, welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite. Thank you, Drew. I'm really happy to be speaking to you. Well, you know, first up, you may not know this, but episode 99 was with a friend of mine by the name of Greg Welch. And I sent Greg a note. Now I know you're laughing. And I sent Greg a note before this interview to see if he had any good questions. And of course, he did because he's Greg Welch. And first he said to say hi to the other Greg Welch in your life. (laughs) Yeah, it's so funny because my husband's name is actually Greg Welch. It's just and so it's, what are it's the odds? I mean it's uncanny. I know. And so uh, sometimes I tease the Greg Welch uh, in my professional life about uh, sending him emails to like pick up milk and and do little. Uh, chores for me, which he always respectfully declines. Oh, really? I, you know, he's a, I would have thought he might have stepped up to that one. Well, the funniest <laughs> thing, I was watching your interview with uh, Jen Rooney uh, at uh, the Forbes conference, and they went to a question, and there in the very far right corner of the picture was, was the Greg Welch we're talking about. So it was just hilarious, and that was what uh, spurred me to reach out to him. So we're going to rapid fire through some of Greg's questions, and then we'll just see how that goes. So right. always remember these are Greg's questions. Because uh, Anyway, you, you worked with Andy Grove at Intel, and the company grew from a billion to 38 billion with Andy at the helm. What did you learn from him? I pretty much learned everything I know about marketing at Intel because I went straight out of school and uh, I worked three cubicles from Andy. And when I arrived, the company was uh, in a very, I would say, nascent state. And it was transitioning from a memory company to a microprocessor company. That's how long ago this was. Wow. And I was fresh out of school, a journalism major, and um, also international relations. And I came to Silicon Valley with no knowledge of what Silicon Valley even was. And it was it was still early days, it's the mid 80s. And uh, Andy had this amazing uh, technical assistant that was kind of like a, a fast track job for, you know, really, really excellent guys. And so uh, this man was named Dennis Carter and he became uh, really my teacher, my mentor, and taught me everything I know about marketing. And between he and Andy, who despite his incredible technical leadership, was also a very good marketer. And he, he yeah. had a knack for um, marketing. But my, my uh, professional life really was changed by Dennis Carter, who was a brilliant engineer, a Harvard MBA, and just, you know, an incredibly prescient guy who came up with Intel Inside, who uh, really, you know, decided that we could indeed uh, market manufa- market um, microprocessors to the public, uh, which seemed like such a crazy idea at the time. And he and I and a very small team, probably five of us, started the work on that back in the late 80s. And, you know, through a lot of hard work, a lot of analysis, he was very early into measuring every single thing we did. And so, uh, and a lot of creativity, we, we actually pulled it off. 
Uh, no, it's a, it's an amazing story, and uh, you know, it's really when you think of ingredient brands. I mean, Intel is the poster child, and then that and bum 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 bum, and that the fact that you got co op dollars to uh, to make that work uh, just made it so much easier for your partners to to push your brand, which is an incredible. Yeah. That sound has a lot of meaning to me personally because I worked on the sound. And a uh, funny story, the guy who I worked with it on was in LA and I was in Santa Clara, California. And uh, we, we partnered and I never met him. So the whole sound was done on the phone <laughs> back and forth. And eventually I met him, but uh, when we debuted it, I had never even met him in person. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's amazing. Well, you know, today, I mean, because of Zoom and all the other ways of communicating, you know, you can work with people for years without meeting them, but uh, this was a, a few years back. So you mentioned the MBA. I know you were a uh, Lehigh undergrad. You never got an MBA. Any regrets on not getting a master's? Absolutely not. Uh, I think, you know, at the time that I actually met Dennis Carter, I was about to go back and get my MBA because I had started in communications and Intel. I had worked four years and, and I really wanted to get into marketing. And so I thought, you know, the best way for me to do that is to go back to school. And Dennis was the one who actually told me to take a pause. And he said, I'm going to I'm going to put you on this project with me, which ultimately became Intel Inside, and try it for six months. If it doesn't work out, go to business school. If we can get something going, uh, then you know maybe you'll decide otherwise. And of course, uh, it did take off. And as I said, literally, I learned everything because I learned you know right from being with him and him teaching me. And, you know, I studied a lot on my own as well and got to work with some amazing um, uh, academics as well as others in the industry. And I felt like I never missed it. There you go. And you were named as one of the world's most influential CMOs last year. So Greg asks, poppycock or deserved? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I try to be humble. Uh, you know, I think I think we've done some extraordinary things at both companies that I've been at. Uh, I've been fortunate to to hit them both at a good time. You know, yeah. Intel just as it was really growing and the PC revolution was occurring, and uh, Adobe just as you know um, uh, the entire world be started to want to become creative and want to measure the impact of marketing and what was going on on other digital channels. So, you know, I, I attribute it a lot to my, my good timing, but also to, you know, the amazing leadership of Andy Grove and then of Shantanu Narayan, my, my current boss, a great team, both at the executive level as well as uh, the teams that I've been, you know, blessed to be able to put together at both companies. And, you know, I've stayed at both companies in incredibly long time from a tech perspective. You know, I've, I was at Intel 20 years and I've been at Adobe over 13 years. So um, I'm, I'm, you know, really happy. Uh, and people ask me, wow, you know, don't, don't you want to move on? And I say no, because there's still so much to do. And so um, it's been, it's been great. Yeah, it's it's funny because uh, so Greg says you know 13 years as a CMO you are ruining Spencer Stewart's uh, CMO <laughs> tenure slide. How exactly. long is too long for a CMO to stay in the chair? <laughs> I know I've I've um, I've gone against all odds at, at both at both companies, but um, again I think it's just when a company is undergoing great growth, when you have great people, when you have great products. And when you continue to be challenged, I think, you know, uh, why leave? Well, and boy, you've got some new challenges, which we're going to talk about uh, in a second. But before uh, we get there, just the one comment, I, I've yet to meet a successful CMO who doesn't praise their CEO. And that just seems to be, you know, the best thing a CMO can do is pick their CEO. Um, there just seems to be no doubt that you really can't succeed uh, without a great one. So you've been on the Mattel board for a few years. Has that how, how has that made you a better executive? Oh, uh, I think that's been one of the best experiences for me. 
me, it's uh, Mattel is the first public board I've ever been on. I've been on a lot of nonprofit boards, but it's a new level of responsibility and accountability. And it's also very interesting in that, you know, I'm a, I'm a doer and I'm pretty hands on when I'm at my day job. And as a board member, you really have to learn how to be um, a, more of a counselor, but somewhat detached because you're, you're overseeing really Really the management of the company and so providing guidance providing counsel but not day-to-day hands-on uh, is is something that that frankly is is very different than the way I typically operate and so I've had to learn how to do that yeah. uh, I, it's it's I think a, a very different skill than than I might have expected but I think it's it's very important actually for uh, executives to try to be on a board, it, it, even if it's a nonprofit board, I think operating in that capacity teaches you how to be more of a counselor and how to look at things more objectively. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, and that is the biggest complaint of putting CMOs on boards is that they, they think they're still in the job. Nope, you've got to step above that, ask good questions. Um, and it really speaks to the leadership um, that requirements of the job as opposed to the executional requirements of the job. Uh, exactly. So it, it's um, uh, excellent. All right. Well, look, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, um, I have lots more questions for you. And, and Greg Welch, I hope your ears are burning. So we'll be right back. Did you know that Renegade Thinkers Unite was ranked number two of the top 10 podcasts for CMOs by Cracker Jack Marketing? Wow. We're really honored. Now, we couldn't do that without amazing guests, and we've had some amazing CMOs on this show, and also terrific listeners like you all. If you like what we do here, please subscribe on your favorite podcast player. That way, you'll never miss an episode. Also, as a special thanks, I'd like to send you a free ebook on Renegade Thinkers. Now, for that, just email drew at renegade.com. Now, let's get back to the show. So we're back, and my guest is Anne Lunis, who is the Executive Vice President and CMO at Adobe. Now, when CMO.com started in 2010, my agency was preaching something that we called marketing as service, and the idea being that marketing could be more than just annoying pollution, but instead, because at that point, uh, advertising was still what most people thought of as marketing, but instead provide genuine value. Now, nine years later, CMO is still, as far as I'm concerned, the poster child for marketing as service. How has your thinking about this property evolved over the years? Yeah, so CMO.com is really a sleeper. I think it's one of probably the best things that we do um, from a thought leadership perspective. And, you know, just a little history, that was a property that we acquired when we acquired Omniture, the web analytics company back in 2000. 2009. And I think, first of all, you know, a priceless URL. And so we were excited to, to dig in there. And I think our, our real objective with it was to be pure thought leadership. It was not an Adobe property. It was intended to really educate a community of CMOs about hot topics, about things they should be thinking about. And, uh, for, I would say, the longest time, people had no idea it was even an Adobe property, which you may or may not think is good from a marketing perspective. But I think it's drawn an audience that our senior level marketers, I think we really try very hard to provide guidance and, um, you know, and, and help people understand the, the key issues that they should be thinking about. So uh, it's, it's a very popular property, and, and obviously we're very excited about continuing to do it. Well, it's interesting because I think when you initially bought it, your your target was not necessarily chief marketing officers. It was certainly part of it, but now it was you, aspirational. <laughs> yes, it it, it was. Um, so to say that Adobe has been on an acquisition street, uh, spree might be the understatement of the decade. Uh, first, Marketo, and just for the record, two of Marketo's CMOs have been on the show, and oh. then Magento who was a client of ours before the uh, acquisition. So um, please say hi to Ms. Ward for me. Um, uh, th this must have created some brand challenges for you. 
how do you even tackle the integration of two big brands like this, especially ones, because I have personal experience with them, have such devoted user communities? Yeah, so um, we have done quite a few acquisitions in the past 10 years. And I would say as a company, we're pretty good at it in that we work really hard with the companies to ensure that they are bringing the best of their company and we're helping them as much as we can while not in any way compromising their success. And so from a marketing perspective, uh, it's always challenging, especially when you have brands that have a lot of equity as both Marketo and Magento do. But uh, we, you know, the second we, we acquire a company, we actually go out and talk to all the customers of that company and we find out what are the things that are really important to them, uh, how, how do they feel about this acquisition. And I would say in both cases, unanimously, people love Magento and Marketo, but they, they were happy. They were happy that Adobe um, was actually um, going to be partnering with them. And so when we see that, we try to, uh, you know, celebrate all the good things about the companies, but slowly bring them into the fold. And one good example is this year at our Adobe Summit, which is our big conference um, about digital experiences. We uh, decided to uh, bring the Marketing Nation, which is Marketo's um, you know, annual show, uh, yep. into the fold. And so the first two days were Adobe Summit and the third day was Marketing Nation. And what we did was we invited all the Marketing Nation people to the first two days of Adobe Summit. A lot of them came. And a bunch of people who were at Adobe Summit stayed an extra day and went to Marketing Nation because the crossover between the audiences is tremendous. Yeah. And so we're trying as much as we can to integrate those things that make sense. And the rest of this stuff will integrate over time. And do you see Adobe as a branded house or a house of brands? I, I would say it's a branded house because, um, you know, we do, of course, have extremely powerful brands like Photoshop and PDF, but um, we, we absolutely have equity in Adobe. And in fact, we do a lot of brand research and we have permission to, to enter pretty much any category in the space of software. Uh, because people feel, you know, very strongly about Adobe's trust, high quality products, uh, and they feel, you know, kinship with us because there are a number of products they've been using, you know, their entire lives. And so uh, I think we have very powerful brands. Our goal is definitely to have Adobe be the lead brand that people think of, and we work to try and associate as much as we can the products with the brand. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, though, I, I could see that very much with uh, with uh, Marketo. Magento's interesting in that you had this whole developer community and the open source and, you know, this sort of that world. It's funny, I did uh, an interview with the CMO of Red Hat and it, it sound, many of the characteristics of, of his user community because it was open source um, felt very similar. Um, that is different than your typical Adobe user. And, it I mean, is. That's, and, and that's got to be as kind of an interesting little part of how do you make sure that we sort of keep those people uh, in the fold. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, the Magento developer community is huge. It's 300,000 plus. And um, that's not, you know, traditionally a big audience for Adobe. I mean, we have developer communities, but that's an incredibly robust community. And you have to work really hard to make them happy. <laughs> and so we, we are continuing to have actually um, in a few weeks, we'll be having um, the Magento Imagine uh, conference. And uh, that's where the developers come in, in droves. And so we have a whole uh, plan for how we're going to continue to keep them, you know, happy and engaged. But you're absolutely right. It is a different audience and they have different requirements. Interesting. So in many ways, you're, you know, I, I could call you a marketing technology company, a software company, but because you now have all of these tools, do, do you need to make sure that your marketing leads by example? Can you be your best case history? 
Oh, completely. You know, there, there. I was invited to speak at the ANA about, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, and I went up there, and I talked about how I felt that if people didn't move to digital, they would be dead. And um, I made a challenge to Bob Leodice at the time, and I said, Bob, you're listening to me now. Now I'm telling you that digital is the way to go. And I think there were a lot of naysayers. And I would add that I was never invited back to speak there again. Uh, <laughs> but I felt like we really needed to be the pioneers because our products are the ones that were going to enable digital marketing to really happen. And so my team at Adobe is called Customer Zero because it's kind of like patient zero. We sure. use all of our creative products. We use obviously Acrobat and we use all of the experience cloud products on a daily basis and we stress test them. We're best in class. We, you know, when we need more features, we go to the product team, we say, hey, can you add this? When we're unhappy with something, we give them our feedback and, and they really work hard to, to try and satisfy us because we are a tough customer. But I mean, I think that's been key to our success, the fact that we can get the tech very early. We, um, you know, we believe in training. We, we believe that our customers need to be fully equipped and well served because our products are not, you know, they're professional products. They're not always easy to use, especially in the experience cloud space. And so we need to provide a lot of support to our customers customers but you know we pride ourselves on really being at the bleeding edge and I spend probably I'll, I would say 25% of my job is talking to, to peers and fellow customers about the experience that we've had moving you know full kind of a hundred percent over to digital and and they're interested not just in the technology because that's not my area of expertise but rather the processes and the types of people so talent and uh, those are the conversations that I'm really having. Yeah. And now with Marketo, um, I imagine that even upped it more. I mean, that was one thing that I always admired. I went to Marketo Nation several times and uh, is they were really good at using their own tool to market Marketo. So now you uh, sort of dovetail that into everything you were doing with Adobe in general. We're so happy that we acquired Marketo. Uh, at, it's going to be, you know, a total game changer for us in, in our B2B marketing efforts here. And uh, we were not using it and really wanted to. And so uh, we're actually right now in the process of the implementation and we're accelerating it uh, as much as we can because it is really a fantastic product when you're doing B2B marketing. And so we're super excited about that acquisition. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, well, and the good news is you have some of the, uh, the experts on it. So uh, you might be able to make that work for you. Uh, uh, so that's, so I wanted a, one counterpoint, because I think it was interesting in your interview with, uh, with uh, Jennifer Rooney at Forbes. The one thing you mentioned that struck me is because we, we could spend our whole time talking about digital marketing, but you mentioned your surprise at how effective events were. Um, what what then, then you initially expected? What sort of changed your mind uh, in, in terms of events? Because they're so not digital. <laughs> exactly. So when I first came to Adobe, we were, we were not doing very much digital marketing, which was shocking to me because I, I think we were doing much more at Intel. And uh, when I kind of looked into the, the you know, ratios of how we were spending our money, events was a huge percentage. And so I said, you know, we've got to stop doing all these events. I, I don't understand how we not, cannot be doing more digital marketing. And so we really pivoted a lot of the dollars to events. Over time, it became so clear to me that events are the way people actually really still um, commune. And if you are a web analyst, if you are a graphic designer, you want to be with your people. And uh, I think that live element of seeing the tech as we introduce it, of being, you know, with fellow designers or fellow analysts uh, is, is visceral. And uh, our events have grown every year 20% um, uh, year over year. So we just had Summit. We had 17,000 people live. And the buzz and, you know, we're busting out of every um, venue that we have uh, gone to. But the vibe at the, these shows is unbelievable. And um, they accelerate business. They get people 
super energized about the company. We also had 800,000 people um, do streams of it, which is extraordinary. And the same thing is happening in the creative space. So uh, I think that that um, blend of offline events and online events and getting that, uh, that ratio exactly right is what we're really striving for, but we're investing more than we ever have in events. So yeah. I, uh, I, I was surprised, but now I've seen it for so many years that you know, I know that it works. Well, and uh, I mean, if you approach these the way Salesforce does with Dreamforce, I mean, these become revenue machines too, which is even more amazing. Um, but uh, all right, so uh, this world of highly digital personal interactions uh, is sort of this yin and yang that uh, that I keep hearing, uh, and, and and I think it's really a great place for us to pause uh, because we're going to then move on to sort of the future forward-looking thinking about marketing that uh, Anne and uh, co-writer, uh, professor have done. So we'll, uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. You've been listening to another great interview on Renegade Thinkers Unite with Drew Neiser. But the value doesn't end there. As a listener, you can download a free ebook from Drew, Renegade Thinkers, interviews with 11 trailblazing CMOs any business can learn from. Top marketing thought leaders and proven executives from Time Warner, American Express, and Chico's, and others. Get your free copy at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook. For listeners only at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook. Okay, we're back. And so you published an article with Kevin Lane Keller in April called The Ten Principles of Modern Marketing in the uh, MIT Sloan Management Review. Now, we don't have time to cover all 10, but let's start with the one that you think will surprise most CMOs. So first of all, I want to do a call out for Kevin Keller because he and I have known each other for probably 20 years and he did one of the kind of big cases on Intel Inside. And then five years ago, he was the head of the Advertising Research Foundation and he asked me if I would do a, a little talk at one of their conferences. And uh, I, I wrote this talk about the, t the five top principles of modern marketing. So five years later, he came back and he said, hey, what do you think about doing um, one together five years later and we'll do the 10 modern tenets of marketing. So um, that's how the whole thing came to pass. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I, I, would, I would say, um, you know, for, for the listeners, one of, one of the most important things is um, the blend of creativity and data. And uh, I know that people ask, it's the eternal question, you know, does data kill creativity? And um, the answer is an absolute no, because, you know, I've never met a creative that doesn't want, you know, to know how their work is being perceived. And I never met an analyst that doesn't want to see the creative work harder. And so I think, you know, that's one of the things that I always encourage my peers to think about. You know, don't go off and do these two things completely in silos. It's really, the magic happens when they're brought together. And I think that's what we've done at Adobe that's really worked. We have side-by-side -side analysts working with creatives and, and kind of brand marketers. And I think that's really what has made it work here. It's interesting. I, I mean, I, I am a big fan of, of data. What I think has happened for a lot of marketers is that they are buried in data. And one of the things that, so I'm working on my second book and really trying to find some very simple, they're compound metrics, but they're simple, one for customers, one for employees, and, and one for sort of prospect and lead, sort of where you are. And as you look at because, I mean, you could have a dashboard, particularly with all your tools, with hundreds of metrics. How do you sort of help folks figure out, well, you know, the, which data is right, is the good data? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. People are all now inundated with data. And uh, it took us years, quite frankly, to figure out what are the kind of key KPIs that we should be tracking that are the ones that really are driving the business because not everything is going to help you. And so we uh, have come up with a model Model. We call it the data-driven operating model, and if, in fact, we talked a lot about it at our recent summit. 
And we look at, it's basically a funnel, but it's a lifetime um, uh, fi funnel for each of our customers. And you know, there are different phases of the journey, starting from discover, which is acquisition, all the way through try, which is for us downloading um, a software trial. Then we get you to buy. Then we want you to engage with the product. And then we um, have renewal. And at each phase of that journey, we have different people accountable. So the discover acquisition phase, that's my team. The try phase, we get you to, to the trial, and then the product team actually has to have you effectively try the, the product. The buy phase moves to the e-commerce team. Um, then the, the product kind of engagement phase, that's back to the product team, and there are KPIs for that, and then renewal has its own KPIs. So each and every phase has its own team, and we meet weekly to look at the KPIs for each of those. And if you're not on your on track with your particular phase, the rest of the team actually kind of is on you because they're 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 you know looking at your phase as critical to the next phase. Right. And so we we don't have a lot of metrics. We have probably you know 10 metrics in each category that are the ones that are you know the most critical. Uh, but now that accountability, that level of discipline, accountability, and really homing in on the key metrics, that's totally changed the way we do business. Interesting. Well, I, the, the, the fact that, one, you have groups that are assigned in these areas, so it's always like something isn't important unless uh, you have somebody assigned to it. Inspection. <laughs> right. But the fact that there's this group accountability, because one of the things that, you know, the classic uh, – optimization is say like a, a cost per acquisition as as a uh, as an optimization or a cost per click which is just a terrible metric but even CPA because there are lots of times you acquire because you lowered your price you can you know you can uh, make those numbers so the fact that there's this group accountability across this journey I think is really an interesting area I'm one of the things that's so hard and intangible, um, but you feel it when you don't have it, and, and that's sort of brand, brand value, brand health, and, and the folks like at Boeing and say, Wells Fargo right now have watched their brand value decline tremendously, and they face this uphill battle of, feel, of, of earning trust. Where does that fit in your sort of, in your metrics model? Yeah, well, I would start out by saying that every company at some point in their in their history has challenges, and you know both Intel and Adobe during my tenure there have had their challenges, and I think you know one of the the key things that you always have to be tracking is how your customers perceive your brand, and at Adobe we are so customer forward. I mean we lean in and we have very strong communities, very vocal communities that we're constantly talking to literally every single day. We have people from the product groups, people from the marketing groups, people from support who are uh, engaged with customers on a daily basis. We aggregate all these learnings um, and you know, back to data that matters, that's the most important data we have, which is customer sentiment about you know, everything possible. And so you need to be that connected to your customer to have a pulse on how they're feeling. You know, I think, you know, we also do brand tracking studies, but I think really the most important thing that we do is staying in constant touch with the community of customers to know how they're feeling about us. Yeah. I mean, and you just can't do that enough uh, because, uh, and, and so that's, and I'm interested in in that uh, you know lots of folks sort of default to Net Promoter as a as a metric there. Um, what's your feeling about that right now? I think Net Promoter is a very good uh, um, metric. We look at it across the board, and in fact, we're I think we're using it really uh, in an advanced way, in that we're tracking it by product. Um, you know, and and we have a lot of products, so uh, I'm all for it. I think we use a number of other metrics as well. Um, whether they're around customer support, um, you know, uptime in a technology business, we have a lot of things that are, you know, system uptime and things like that are, are also critical metrics for, for success. But for instance, in the creative cloud, uh, we look at uh, engagement metrics. So have you downloaded a product? Are you using the product? Those are really important to us because if you're not using a software product, you're not going to renew. 
And yep. so we look at a whole slew of metrics, um, you know, not too many, but we, we call them high value actions, things that we believe are actually triggers for uh, either a purchase or a renewal. And those are really important to track. Yeah, I imagine the high value inactions or the sort of, <laughs> uh-oh, if, if they haven't downloaded it, uh, we better get on that case because exactly. uh, there's, a, there's a renewal that's not going to happen. Um, and so you talked about this new type of customer relationship. Um, where are marketers coming up short in this area? I think, you know, uh, in the technology business, I, I will say it's a little bit simpler because we do have very engaged customers from a digital perspective. They're online and they are letting you know what they think um, pretty frequently. So I would say uh, it's important to figure out, again, what the high value conversations you can have with your customer are. One thing that we've done very effectively is co-create with our community. And now this isn't going to always be applicable across all industries, but I'll give you a couple of examples. Our community and creative community love to make things and they love to show off the things they make. And so we give them weekly challenges to show off their work. So we'll post a social challenge. We just did one with actor and now director Zach Braff, where uh, we asked folks in our community, design a poster and um, Zach Braff is going to pick the best poster and make a short film about it. And so we get thousands of amazing submissions from people uh, who want to show off their work. And then we pick uh, a winner. And that person actually got to work with Zach Braff on a film. How cool uh, is that? The, yeah. In the experience cloud business, we do something called Hack the Bracket with uh, analytics customers. And that's, again, something that's enormously successful because customers get so engaged. And the community then gets to see all these really excited customers. So I think there are ways that every company can look to, you know, engage their customers in a very deep and meaningful way. And uh, that's what I would encourage people to do. Well, and it makes a lot of sense because uh, in your case, that just gives you all sorts of content that you can then use uh, as, you know, for, for all your social, for, you know, and, and, and marketing. So Exactly. Um, we amplify uh, all that content. W which is awesome. But what I, what I love about it, lots of people run photo contests or, or contests, but what they don't do is create it in such a way that is, wow, that's cool, where, where the, the prize it feels fresh and, you know, uh, having Zach Braff make a movie about a poster. It's kind of a cool idea. And, it, and it's not your cookie cutter, uh, you know, photo contest. No, and there are endless challenges. We're doing one now with um, a very cool young female musician named Billie Eilish. And, um, and that's a totally different segment because this is going to be a much younger audience that wants to engage uh, in that activity. We're doing them literally every week. Wow. Okay. Now I know we're going to be running out of time, but I want, I, we haven't talked about, and this is one of sort of the things that I'm really zeroing, zeroing in on for marketers as they sort of look at the big picture. We haven't talked at all about the role that marketing can play with employee engagement. Yeah. And and I'm just curious in your perspective, um, because a, a lot of times when I talk to CMOs, they'll say, well, I can't really touch that because HR says this, uh, well, I got this. Um, and that's a quote. But I feel like the, the, the CMO has to get employees on board one way or another uh, and believe in the mission or the purpose of the organization. Can you speak to that? Am, am I all wet or is, a, is employee engagement an important part of the way you think about your, your role? Employee engagement is a huge part of what I think about. And in fact, um, the employee communications group reports into me and they are in lockstep with our people in places uh, organization. And I am in lockstep with the head of that organization. You know, from a recruitment perspective, your brand is so important. From, from a, um, you know, uh, satisfaction perspective, uh, um, your brand is so important. You know, our employees, our 20,000 employers are the biggest brand evangelists that we have. And so we want them to be out there um, excited about the company. We have, you know, a very progressive set of um, uh, activities that we have been investing in, whether it's um, very generous 
family leave policies. Uh, we just uh, accomplished worldwide uh, gender pay parity, which is very, very unique, especially in the tech space. And we, you know, we really celebrate these, these progressive policies. And our employees, um, as a result, are very happy. So I think brand and um, people work hand in hand. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, can you articulate Adobe's purpose? Yeah, our purpose is pretty um, simple and very grand. <laughs> it is uh, to change the world through digital experiences. And, um, you know, about 10 years ago when we first came up with it, it was very aspirational. And I think it, we've actually grown into it. And it, it's not just about enabling people to create and to um, use data um, effectively. It's about how they do it, you know, at Adobe, it's it's not just the what, it's the how. That's kind of one of our, um, you know, internal slogans. You know, how we do things is as important as what we actually accomplish. We're good people. And um, in the technology category, we're known as being a really kind company. And that's not always the case with a lot of other tech companies. So we pride ourselves on it. We have a very uh, aspirational mission, but I think we've done a pretty good job of making it happen. Yeah, I, re- I love the fact that you grew into your, your purpose and that, and that uh, it should be inspiring to a lot of companies who are thinking about their purpose and trying to decide and they look at it and if they define it in terms of what they are today, um, they may be uh, limiting uh, their, their, their vision, if you will, for the organization. What a great, um, yeah, let's, let's change the world. I want to work for that company. Uh, <laughs> why w- wouldn't you? So, um, all right, as we wrap this episode up, I I wonder if there are sort of, there's one or two things that you wish you knew as CMO 10 years ago that you know now. That's such a good question. Uh, I think, you know, a long time ago, one of my first bosses told me, um, and you can't go to the mat for everything. And that's been kind of a life lesson for me because I'm super passionate and and I always want to go and, um, you know, do kind of the most extreme thing. Related to that, um, my my current boss, Shantanu Narayan, said, there are flag planters in the world and there are road builders. And um, and you're a flag planter. And I think um, that is very related to not going to the mat for everything, but I feel probably you know, that, that my role has been to look out into the future, um, you know, maybe make a crazy bet on digital marketing and then be able to inspire the people around me, amass an incredible team and try and get them there. And uh, I think that's what I've learned. Perfect. What a great place to wrap up. Uh, one of the, the things, and we will link to the article in the, in the show notes, um, but one of the things that, that really struck me uh, as we think about it is just the need for thinking big uh, in, in all of this. Uh, in it, it's so often forgotten, but uh, so let's, let's go out there and plant some really big flags. Um, maybe you don't win all the, the little skirmishes, but let's, let's go for those big flags. So, um, Anne, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Drew. It was super fun. And to all the listeners, I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, and as always, until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong. <laughs> This has been Renegade Thinkers Unite, but it doesn't end there. Just go to renegadethinkersunite.com for more and subscribe to the show. That way, you'll never miss an episode. We'll talk with you next time on Renegade Thinkers Unite.